Well, thank you for having me. Um, what I figured I'd come and, and share with you guys today is uh, briefly talk about how the FJ Labs models works. And maybe it takes a, it, taking a little bit of uh, history or step back because it's not as though I decided, oh, let's go build a studio. I think what happened is for the last 22 years, I've been a tech entrepreneur and founder and CEO of various marketplace startups. And from the get-go, when you're a visible consumer-facing internet CEO, a lot of people ask you for money and advice. And so from the get-go, I thought through, okay, should I be investing as well as building companies? And I realized, you know, if I can explain it, it means I've actually internalized it. And if I, by meeting all these amazing entrepreneurs, A, I'm helping them fulfill their dreams. And I think that's very uh, valuable. But at the same time, it keeps my pulse on the market. I get a sense of what's going on. And so in 2013, when I sold my last big company, OLX, which of course is 5,000 employees and, and 30 countries, is 350 million uniques. I'm like, I like building companies. I like investing in companies. And so I created FJ Labs. Hi, FJ Labs is a hybrid uh, venture fund and startup studio. So every year we invest, kind of like, kind of behave like an angel investors because we don't lead, we don't price, we don't take board seats. We invest in over a hundred companies a year, uh, mostly new companies, mostly marketplaces. So if you look at us, we're 70% uh, US, 70% marketplaces, 70% seed, but we do invest in every geography and in every industry. And so if you look at our overall breakdown, we're like 70% US, 20% Western Europe and Nordics, 10% Brazil and India, where 70% you know, the vast majority, let's say pre-seed, seed and A, uh, with a sparkling of B's, B's and C's. And um, the, the reason we behave like angels is, you know, we, I actually don't have a set portfolio construction theory. It's not as though I'm like, oh, I want to invest in that many deals. It's more, if I meet companies I like, I invest in them. If I don't, I don't. Now, I love marketplaces. And so I focus on marketplaces, which has led to this interesting network effect where I get, because I'm known as a marketplace investor, I get all the marketplace deals and, and it, I get so many at-bats that I improve my decision-making. At the same time, because I like building companies, every year I build on average, two companies, and we have a very specific model, and, and I'm going to share the way it works. So um, every year, we we basically help come up with the idea, but we don't. The idea can come from different places, and I'll talk about how we can come up with the ideas. We and we have a a, a model. We we put in the first seven hundred fifty seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in exchange for thirty five percent of the equity. So we make sure that the founders have the majority of the equity. They have sixty five percent. We have 35%, even though we're hiring them, we're paying them, we're giving, and we're coming up often with the idea. I'm executive chairman and co-founder. I help build the product, the technology, the team, whatever they need. And then we commit as well the next 2 million. So they also get 2 million at either a 10 million valuation or market price if they can get a better terms. This way they can get guaranteed the first 2.75 million without needing to, to ever raise money. Um, so it, it, it might be helpful just to make sure we're all aligned first on a good definition, definition of a venture studio. Uh, I like to use the analogy of, the, of a movie studio when I'm explaining this to people. So if, if you were to travel back in time um, over 100 years ago, you'd be able to witness the formation, formation of the first movie studios. And this is a model that was likely inevitable in that industry, just as I believe the venture studio model uh, was inevitable, is, is inevitable in the startup and venture investing ecosystem. So it, it's really hard to create a movie. Uh, but I imagine uh, you learn a lot in the process the first time you do it, and each subsequent movie that you create becomes easier in some ways. You learn uh, who you like to work with. Uh, you learn to be more efficient in the ways to produce and edit the movie. Uh, you learn over time uh, a lot about which movies uh, will be more commercially viable and attract a bigger audience. And so uh, movie studios were formed over 100 years ago to, uh, to take advantage of economies of scale and scope uh, by pulling together actors and actresses and camera operators and directors and script writers and all these things into a single company, a movie studio. Movies became less expensive to produce, uh, more commercially viable, more likely to succeed. Uh, similarly, we've, we've learned a, a tremendous amount over the last few decades about how to launch and especially how to fund and invest in startup companies. And if, if you've launched a company before, you know that the first time you do it, it's 
really hard. There's a lot to learn. You learn a lot about laws and regulations, about how to set up payroll, uh, different structures for incorporation, how to hire employees, how to spread the word about what you're doing and so on. Uh, the theory of the venture studio model is that a lot of that knowledge is scalable across startups and that certain expertise can be centralized to enable startups to move faster, to launch more companies uh, and to increase the commercial viability of the startups. So just like a movie studio centralizes script writers and actors, a venture studio centralizes important functions like marketing or sales or design or engineering and so on to enable the founders of those companies to focus more of their energy on understanding their customers and building a killer product. Um, that's the goal of the venture studio model. Uh, companies that come out of well-run venture studios move faster and create more value than independent startups in the wild. And there's some good research being done to prove that point out. So let, let's get a little bit more specific on the definition of a venture studio. At, at High Alpha, uh, we define a venture studio as the combination of a build function plus a dedicated source of capital. Uh, and that a venture studio produces startups. There's some nuance, nuance in terminology here um, that's worth mentioning. Uh, uh, but in my view, a venture studio without capital with just the build function is actually not a venture studio at all. Uh, but a startup studio, and again, that's uh, maybe maybe too much nuance to be useful. Uh, but in, in my mind, uh, you add an investment fund to a startup studio and you get a venture studio. Um, and we'll talk about just a bit why, why having a source of capital is so critical to the success of a studio. But again, to summarize, uh, the way I define a venture studio, a venture studio combines a build function with a source of capital to systematically create startup companies. Now, there's a, there's a lot of confusion in the market, I think, still about how a venture studio is different from an accelerator, from an incubator, or even from a venture capital fund. And here's a, a little two by two that we often use to explain the difference. Uh, it probably oversimplifies uh, some things, but it, it, I, we find this a, a useful way to explain the, um, the difference. In brief, a venture studio goes all in on the capital and support for the startups it launches and invests in. Um, that, that isn't meant to diminish the, uh, the important roles uh, that incubators and accelerators and venture capital funds play, not at all. Not every startup needs uh, a venture studio. Not every startup is a good fit for a venture studio model, but when it works, it can work very, very well. So, like I said, we look for opportunities that are big and broken, and then we brainstorm technology solutions to fix them. Um, you know, we're not interested in doing things that we don't find interesting. We're not interested in doing things uh, that we don't feel are going to have a large impact. Uh, and we're not interested in doing things that we're sort of have incremental improvement uh, over things that already exist. You know, we want big opportunities. We want venture backable opportunities. We want scalable opportunities. Uh, and while there are many uh, interesting things to work on uh, across the startup landscape, you know, we work in the venture backable business, meaning we need big markets. Uh, we need, you know, uh, opportunity for $100 million of revenue in these companies to get those investors excited. And ultimately, we need liquidity events. So we need these companies to be acquired or to go public so that we can not only uh, distribute dollars to founders and employees, but to the investors that back our companies. Uh, and so that only happens if we're focused on uh, big, interesting problems. Uh, and then figuring out how to solve those. Um, you know, over the last 24 years, we've done more than 150 companies. Uh, we're a little bit all over the map. Uh, we'll do uh, enterprise, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, advertising technology, consumer. Um, we'll do just about anything that we feel we can test in a reasonable uh, way, meaning it's it's fairly low cost and that we, we can find some domain expertise in that area. The only things we don't do are typically in uh, bio or medical devices, things that need, at least in the States, FDA approval or clinical trials where the cost of capital to do these things, to test these things is quite larger than what you can do uh, on the software or even hardware side when you don't have to go through those uh, you know, clinical uh, decision-making trees and, and the things that take longer to do. But outside of that, we'll do just about anything. Um, so how do we come up with ideas? Well, we have a founder by the name of Bill Gross 
uh, that other people don't. So this is our competitive advantage. Um, a lot of our ideas, a large majority of our ideas come from Bill. Uh, he's an amazing entrepreneur. He's been starting companies his whole life. Um, he's founded more than 100 of the companies that, that we've done out of Idea Lab. Uh, prior to starting Idea Lab, he actually uh, started a few companies and started a company called Knowledge Adventure, which was an educational technology company. Uh, and one of the investors in that company was Steven Spielberg, the, the famous entertainment director. Uh, and he, you know, Bill noticed that in, in entertainment, you have a centralized studio. Uh, you can work on a bunch of different projects at once, taking advantage of that uh, centralized support system uh, and wanted to do the same thing in the technology space. So not be a serial entrepreneur, but be a parallel entrepreneur. Um, and so Ideal I was born in 1996 to do just that. So how do we, you know, uh, centralize things like legal, finance, uh, HR, uh, recruiting, uh, uh, so that, you know, companies that are being started can focus on product and customers. You know, that's the most important thing that a startup can focus on is product and customers. If you're dealing with, you know, signing leases or employment agreements or, you know, all the other painful things that need to be done when you're starting a company, your attention is taken away from product and customers and put towards all these other activities. So we want to make sure that, you know, we can handle the things that uh, a typical founder doesn't want to deal with. Uh, you know, it used to be, where do you find an office? Although that's changed in this world. Um, but, you know, how do I deal with employment agreements? Um, how do I deal with legal? Uh, all these things that you have to deal with, you know, Idea Lab can handle for you. In terms of our structure, um, we have five managing directors and it's sort of like we're right in between having five and four. Uh, but you can see myself there on the left, Greg and Jeff um, and Mike Galgon were the founders of PSL. Um, and the managing directors sit across both the venture fund and the studio. And we have emerging senior leaders like David, who's an emerging MD on the studio side and Ben, who's an emerging GP slash MD on the fund side. And Mike Galgon is in the process of sort of becoming a venture partner. So he'll leave day-to-day -day operations and still work on the companies that he created. But we've sort of, we're at this point in transition where we have both people coming up, people moving to the side um, and continuing to think about the venture and studio together. So as MDs, we do sit across and have economic interest in both of those entities the studio and the venture fund, though as described here, Julie is very venture fund centric and very light on studio. And I'm very heavy on studio and relatively light on venture fund. Underneath all of us, we've got another core team of 15 people that are designers, software developers, data scientists, operations people, which create and help manage the companies and obviously PSL, recruiting and go to market. And when we put all those things together and wrap them around an entrepreneur, we have been very successful in turning those entrepreneurs and those ideas into companies. More than half of our team have been founders. So even if you're a software developer or data scientist or in operations, they've been a founder of a company before. And so there's lots and lots of founder empathy and founder DNA spread all over PSL. In the Pacific Northwest and in the US uh, as a whole, um, diversity is really important. And we feel like at the studio, we have a unique opportunity to do a couple of things. One is find, um, identify and train sort of underrepresented founders. So whether it be female founders, black indigenous people of color, um, different people who don't look like me, who might be great founders and just need a little bit more sort of support in the studio model. We also can take those founders regardless of what they look like and we can build diversity from day one. So we have a whole program where a, a single CEO is starting to think about their team and they're starting to build in diversity from day one. So if you build a diverse team in the first five or first 10 people, you have a dramatically better chance of having a diverse team going forward. If you end up in the inverse, if you have 10 people who end up looking like me, it becomes that much more challenging for you to start to hire diverse people over time. So we believe strongly in this, as you can see by our numbers, you know, 35% of our companies have female founders, one or more. Um, and 25% are um, um, uh, more diverse founders as well. 
Um, and we've done a bunch of work on this. If you check out like tech jobs demystified, we've started to think about how do we bring more diverse people in, not necessarily the founder level, but what we call the first five. So how are people coming into a company as the first five employees who might be on marketing or software development or design that are more diverse in their background? So of course, because we're like that, we like to make models. Uh, and if you don't, you're in the wrong game. Running a CDO is making processes and models. So uh, this is the most important thing you can do. Um, once we're running the companies, we're doing this model. We're planning ahead. So we're not gonna do a startup where we say, sell as much as you can, no. We're actually gonna say, this is when we want to build the product. This is where we do sales. We try to make a model out of this so we can have repeatable success. And each week we do a, a recap with each other. And that takes at least an hour where we just sit down and talk about what went well. Uh, I actually called the good, the bad and the ugly. So what went good, what went bad and what's really ugly. And I mean, ugly could be something you just want to get off your chest. And in that weekly recap, we also ask each other, what's the one thing we could do to go faster? And it could even be is that, you know, Michael, you're sitting in the way. Uh, you don't have to help me with everything. That could be that point. Well, once you're doing that weekly, uh, you also like to check in each three months. How are we doing? Is this like a, is this, uh, is this still working out? I mean, we as a studio are co-founders, but uh, more or less, most of us after a year or two years are leaving the States, right? So it's really important to know that are they independent? What do they need of you? Uh, are you pulling your weight, your own weight? Are you an operator they like to work with? Or are you just trying to be the investor kind of guy? And then the most important one, which is also really hard, is uh, once in a while you do supportive confrontation. And I don't know if you've done this, but to keep it in the romantic fashion, it's more or less relationship therapy. Uh, but before you get into a fight, so you will tell each other, uh, the positive things, but also the negative things without being judgmental. And the other side can only say, thank you. You can't, you can't do a debate. And this way uh, we found out is that if we do this kind of therapy with each other, we can have a more or less prosperous relationship uh, for the long term. And also things that are, are not being said in all the other meetings will get said here, which basically means that you can move on and hopefully avoid uh, clashing with your co-founders because this happens. I mean, this is a new call. So uh, founder matching is the most important thing, but could still go wrong. But you know, we're in our dream state. So everything for this studio is going the right way. So nothing is going wrong. And I think everyone, if you're all entrepreneurs, everyone kind of knows these numbers, right? The problem with The problem with bringing that venture building and startup studio model into the corporate world is that the truth just is that 90% of startups fail, right? And everyone always says that, and that number is in everyone's head. And we actually went out to another study to look at the numbers, which um, which turned out to be um, to be basically just that. If we've now seen kind of that that most startups fail, we as entrepreneurs know that, uh, that there's certain ways of um, of trying to improve the odds and stack the odds in our favor, right? So the question, what makes a startup successful is according to Eric Ries, which I'm sure many of you have read, the Lean Startup, it's the boring stuff that matters the most. Startup success can be engineered by following the right process, right? Um, and what he means by that is that uh, as cool as it sounds, being creative and, and, uh, and building a startup, just kind of dreaming up ideas, building a startup because you have great ideas and so on. Startup success in large parts um, uh, it's down to the fact that you you have to kind of approach it as scientifically as possible and you have to put a process in place, a repeatable process in place that guarantees you a certain level of success that ideally is beyond um, the success levels that we saw before. And we at Striver, and this is not only because we're, we're German and Swiss, but we um, we like to follow that model and we like to we like to put a, a very strong and solid process in place. Um, in order that our startups go through and that we use for our startups in order to try to improve those odds that we saw on the slide before. And we can go into some of the detail here though. So, so kind of the way we, um, we kind of um, 
a second hour work is in three parts. There's in the beginning a strategy stage that is kind of very important and talks a lot about when we speak with corporates about a lot of the issues we mentioned earlier, kind of setting it up in the right way, speaking about corporate governance structure in order to make sure that the building of a startup is not, is not just part of the core business and isn't just another project um, um, in the core business because, because it doesn't work like that. It must work on different time scales and different investment scales and schedules on different um, success measurement and so on. Um, so that is in the corporate context, very interesting um, and important. What's also in, interesting and important here is the second piece on the strategy stage, which is the investment thesis, which is where we think about what for this particular corporate, what are really the topics that you want to invest, investigate in the first place and then invest in and build, right? So what are the startups that you, what are the areas of startups, first of all, and then what are the particular startups that you want to build? And the way we go about it, and we'll go into some detail in the next slides there as well, is um, is not in the creative, let's do some brainstorming sessions kind of way usually, but we do that in a very data-driven way, looking at what startups are out there worldwide, what are kind of gain, what startups are gaining traction in some geographies very early on and very quickly. Why is that? Is that because they're onto something really, really exciting? Maybe we should look at that, right? This is kind of the way we go about it rather than the Let's just sit in a room together and see if we can come up with great ideas. But this is all part of that first stage. The second stage is then what we really focus on and where, again, where most of the people that work for Stripe are also focused on, which is the seed stage. So building that company and building that startup through the early stages, building an MVP um, and getting to a point where after that seed stage, you can say, yes, we are relatively confident that this is something that can be really exciting. So keep investing here or um, no, we've tried to validate certain hypotheses that we had about this um, this particular opportunity, but we haven't been able to do so. And as a matter of fact, we believe those hypotheses were wrong, so we would not invest any more uh, any more money in it. Right? And this kind of hypothesis-driven work is what you know, what Eric Ries is all about in the Lean Startup, and what we at Strive are all about. And in that, what we want to do in that seed stage is the goal isn't to build an MVP, and the goal isn't necessarily to build a product. The goal is to um, get learnings out of that process and get learnings on the kind of key hypothesis that you had going in, which we define in the very, very beginning. I want to expand on the fifth option, which is to raise money that goes directly into your studio that your studio can use to produce new ventures. Uh, do the initial life cycle phases, uh, problem identification, ideation, uh, prototype build, initial validation, and finding the product market fit when the company um, is ready to receive uh, follow-on investments. And of course, there would be the option, some of the studios uh, create companies not because they want to raise additional money, but because they want those companies to become a good source for cash flow that they can bring in uh, to the basic company. That's also an option. But for today, let's look at how to raise uh, money uh, for the studio itself. And the two basic uh, options that I would like to uh, explore uh, is when you raise your fund directly into your startup studio, so directly into that uh, legal entity that contains your core team, your entrepreneurs, and everything else. <clears throat> and the second option is uh, when you raise uh, the money and set up a new legal entity that will manage and allocate that money. Now the first option is uh, when raising money directly into the studio. And for that, I assume that you have a company that now we call Startup Studio this could also be like a development agency that you are just about to transform into a studio. But there is one company 
and you find one or more investors to put money into this company for in exchange for equity and you use that money through this company to create new ventures startup one startup two startup x now in this structure uh, it seems simple because you already have an operating company with a, with a team uh, that is able to produce these companies and uh, it seems simple but um, and it you know if during the negotiations uh, uh, you can negotiate for a good uh, valuation for this basic startup studio company then you can potentially have a high amount of money for uh, uh, for a good amount of equity so uh during this session i'm going to point out the different startup studio model and especially i mean the most common like the single fund model the single studio model the single studio model plus syndicate and the dual entity model and i'm going to point out the advantages and disadvantages of any model and especially why the dual entity model is the most efficient way of funding a studio and also a way of aligning the interest between studio founders and a holding manager Okay, the dual entity model. Well, this model, it's a little bit, you know, you have an addition in complexity and usually I don't love complexity. But in this case, I can understand why some studios such science, atomic, and M13 apply this model because definitely it works well. So in this case, instead of having one entity, we have two entity. We have the studio and the fund. And the fund will fund the studio. So we'll put money in the studio to cover the running cost, or if you want to sell it better, or, well, actually, this is what it is. It's you're, you know, with very small investment, you're getting out as an investor, a pre-order of startups. Because you know that that team, let's say, of course, in this case, you have to trust the team. You have to uh, be, um, be sure that their way, their focus, that you love the studio focus. So you love the studio focus. You think that the team is a good team and you think that this team is going to produce what you think. So if you have this kind of trust, well, the studio fund, will cover the running cost of the studio and so you give them some money you you give to the studio some money up front but just to cover the running cost so you have an alignment of interest between the studio and the fund and since the fund usually in this case get a liquidation preference so you will know that studio manager are definitely aligned because if, you, if they don't make good startups, they will not get their money out there. So they will need to produce well in order to get money because the studio fund will get the money first because they have a liquidation preference. So, and then the studio produces the startups. So the studio and the founder are aligned in terms of interest because they have common shares. So they work together. They have the same interest. They have to be uh, to work for the same thing. They have to go for an exit. And then the studio fund usually get a fourth right of refusal for their startups that comes out from the studio. So the studio fund will not invest in all the startups that come out from the studio. It will invest only in the best startups that will come out from the studio. So in this case also, all the, all the founders, they have to, you know, 
they know that 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 if they work well, they will get the money, but they're not sure. So, you know, it also starts a good competition between startups to get their money. So in this case, the studio fund has the investor rights, but the studio fund is also can work with a, with a simple 220, like all the fund, because they will have only the managers. So it will work. So this, this, kind, of, uh, this kind of structure, it works well because the, the interests are aligned between the studio and the studio fund and the interests are aligned between the studio and the startups. And we have a good model, which even if it's a little bit complex, it works pretty well because it, you get a perfect alignment. Now let's get on to today's uh, topic, which is the presentation around the smart money that's investing in startup studios. So I'm excited to dive into this data with you. We've, I think, completed maybe the most comprehensive research on studio investors, who they are, what studios did they invest in, you know, when did they invest? And, and so we're presenting this data and excited to share here with you guys as well. Uh, what we're finding more and more is that they're coming from all walks in, of life and taking the plunge into the studio category. And they, they, they generally fall into the four categories that you would expect. So you have your angels, you have your VCs, you have your corporates, and you have your institutional LPs. It's interesting that they each kind of come for their own reasons and they're different and we'll get to that. But, you know, it's kind of a who's who's list, right? Under angels, you have some of the most uh, famous and successful business people, you know, uh, recognize most of them, you know, the first one is Blake Irving, the CEO of GoDaddy. You have Tim Ferriss, um, podcast host, best-selling author, prolific angel investor, Mark Andreessen, right? He's one of the VC gods, right? One of the top 10 global VC firm, Andreessen Horowitz. You have Meg Whitman, HP's former CEO, Peter Thiel from PayPal Mafia and Founders Fund. David Rubenstein, the billionaire founder of the PE firm Carlyle Group. Um, you know, it's a pretty good group. I think we would all agree. Uh, I think that they, they probably have pretty good decision-making skills as it relates to business and investing. So if they're investing in studios, it's probably a pretty good idea, but let's not stop there. Uh, you have all of these VC firms that have also invested in studios. Um, so from SoftBank to Sequoia to Index to Menlo, you even have the accelerators getting in the game with uh, Y Combinator and Techstars, right? Um, so I think it's really interesting to see that, that VCs are seeing studios as really good deal flow and wanting to get in early because they know the quality of what comes out of studios is, is top notch. And then you have corporates, a lot, lot of good corporate successes. Uh, we need to add to this list. There's obviously much more corporates that have worked with studios, uh, but you see some kind of global brands there with Virgin and AOL and New York Times and Intel. And then last but not least, we, have, we see some institutional LPs with their Green Springs and Black Rocks and even governments like Michigan and the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. And now we're starting to see some funds that are popping up exclusively focused with an investment thesis around studios, like a fund of funds, but a fund of studios that the only invest in studios. After uh, the social good marketplace, uh, we ran that for five years and um, it was a heck of a run. Um, I was not a technology uh, person, meaning I, I, I'm not a coder didn't have a tech co-founder and man, we built massive technical debt, raised money about a million and two, um, but in check sizes of five to 25,000 over five years. And it was death by paper cuts. Um, and by the time we kind of cracked the code of the growth and the business and all that and raised our A round, uh, went out to raise our A round, our biggest uh, comp in the marketplace imploded. And so we got series A crunched, um, which is the uh, technical term for, we ran out of money. <laughs> and, uh, and when we ran out of money, um, we decided uh, that the only thing to do was to restructure and sell the assets for penny on the dollar. This ties into the new venture criteria because what happened next was um, I lost personally about a million of my own dollars and certainly five years of my life and probably 10 years off the end of my life in that uh, venture. 
Um, it was a heck of a run. You know, I was recognized by Forbes uh, in 2011 as a name you need to know. We were on the Today Show and all these different things, but the business model didn't work. We had low gross profit margin um, and we were trying to be everything to everybody. So instead of the multi-million dollar exit that I was hoping and expecting from that, um, I walked away uh, with uh, the opportunity to lick my wounds and learn from the failure. So when we sold the final assets, um, I uh, booked an Airbnb in a little uh, um, mountain town uh, near Los Angeles uh, called Big Bear. Um, and I told everybody to fuck off <laughs> and went for five days and took my dog, shut off my phone and took all of the data from the last five years of the thousand brands under management that we had worked with, and as well as my experience of doing the customer acquisition. And I said, if I'm not gonna have the financial return, I'm gonna have the learning return. Um, and that's really where the new venture criteria that we're about to talk about today came out of. Um, pouring over that data over five days, I really found five common denominator, omnipresent factors to be present inside of any brand that gets traction online and grows and scales. I'm not going to talk about the anomalies that are out there that just kind of catch fire and wind. And, you know, sometimes those things happen and I, I, you can't really plan for those. But in blocking and tackling e-commerce businesses, I found these five criteria, which we're about to go through, um, to be the omnipresent versions uh, of, of what needs to be there in order to find product market fit uh, or have a chance of that and, and scale. I came out of the mountains, you know, Moses with his tablet, so to speak, me and my notebook with my five criteria saying, I think I have something here. Um, and then uh, I said, well, what do I do with it? Uh, and so uh, I went and worked at a, a VC fund as an entrepreneur in residence, Crosscut Ventures in Los Angeles. And they started plugging me into early stage ventures um, to help build growth uh, marketing teams from the inside out. And so Stealth Venture Labs started there. Um, it started as uh, consulting, advising, and some small angel investing. Uh, and for the first four years of this company, we were co-founders of about 10 different subscription e-commerce brands, but working with probably about 40 or 50 um, in the United States. And in that time, I started applying these five new venture criteria to our clients, partners, and our own ventures in-house. And what I found is that this is, these five criteria are the best predictor of success or the best um, predictor of finding early stage uh, product market fit to be able to grow and scale. They're not the be all end all, uh, but they started to really, really hold up uh, over time. Okay, so the five criteria are as follows. Um, we have the first one, passionate interest group. <laughs> I'll come back and I'll talk about each one. Number one, passionate interest group. Number two, large addressable market. Number three, disruptive value proposition. At number four, compelling unit economics, which breaks down into two uh, pieces, which is a, a, a good price point for the customer and uh, higher than 50% gross product margin uh, for your, uh, your margin profile. And then number five is solves a market or customer pain. It seems in many ways, you know, when you're launching a company, you kind of come in with all the passion and the, you know, your positive energy, which is, and it seems like a little bit of a negative to kind of focus on um, the, the negative uh, setbacks that you might be running into. Um, but I believe it's important that you understand with any startup, the challenges that you're going to face. Um, and that you recognize it as early as possible so that you can plan, build structure, build contingencies, and build a model that can get you through that process. Um, so I, I really am a big believer in this concept. And, and I think it's at, at the core of when you're thinking through your business model at the very beginning stages that you understand this. Um, what are the things that are going to go wrong so that I'm thinking about it now versus when it actually starts to occur? The other area gets into the um, process of securing appropriate funding. Um, I'm always a big believer in, you know, uh, structuring your equ equity um, in your company and, you know, not giving away too much too fast. But when you do give away equity, you're giving it away at the right time and you're getting the right thing out of that process. Um, and there's an art in, in, in that in itself because many founders, I think, um, either try to go out and raise too much uh, early on and they give up too much, uh, or they raise very little and they give up too much. 
And so I'm a big believer that you have to work really hard to start to at least prove the value and prove your business model um, as early as possible. The more proof points you have, the more that you can build it out and think through it, the more your value uh, is going to go up uh, ultimately in the funding situation. I also believe that there's many different ways to raise money. And I know a lot of people struggle in this area of raising capital, but I think if you go through the hard work of building a good plan, um, you build a good business plan structure that you go out and you prove out your model um, as part of the process. If you've got the right team structure around you, if you have the right elements, you will find the funding. There's, there's so much opportunity for funding out there right now. It's more than it's ever been before. Um, and so I think you just got to be smart and realistic on how you approach it. And of course, then making a strong business plan. And it's about building a business plan three to five years out because ultimately, yes, everyone's looking for long-term where you want to take the business. But I like the emphasize the importance of the first year more than anything. When I look at businesses as an investor, I'm looking at three, six, 12 months. What exactly? happen and how are you going to invest your dollars? How are you going to utilize it? What are those key milestones and where are you going to net out over that time period? Because to me, that is where the bulk of the risk tends to occur um, is at those early stages of proving out the model. Um, so I, you know, I believe that you have to be able to see that. I think a lot of investors are so caught up into the potential value of where a startup might be three to five years out and how they get their return. But I look at it a little bit differently because I think most of the failures happen early on. And if you could understand that part of the business model, and if you can go deeper into that, um, you as an entrepreneur will be more successful. And as an investor, you're going to be more successful as well. And then the last component is the importance of finding the right team. I talked about this earlier. I'm a big believer in collaboration. Um, you know, the majority of startups out there, you know, have small teams and, You've got to understand what makes up a good team and diversify as much. And when I'm looking for people around me, I'm looking for different skill sets at the table better than I can do it um, or how I might approach it. Um, to me, that is what builds a great structure. And I'm also obviously looking for people that I can collaborate with and can help me uh, uh, properly grow it as part of the process. Um, wicked problems are, um, are these massive things that people haven't tackled or challenged in a significant way. Uh, we see them in health. We see them in learning and the future of work. We see them in climate change and water. And, and, and my assertion here is going to be this. If a portion of your capital, if you're an investor, isn't allocated to tackling uh, these problems, then effectively you're missing massive opportunities. But I can say this a bit differently. I can also say that if you're uh, thinking about business, if you're thinking about creating a startup studio, if you are a startup studio and you're not thinking about ways that you can begin to do something about these kinds of problems or challenges, you're also missing an opportunity. So um, I'll call attention to what I mean when I talk about the entrepreneurs in the mix. This is Cheryl Kelland. Uh, Cheryl Kelland created Apostrophe Health uh, in Colorado back in 20, I want to say 2016. She participated in our first program, was inspired to create this, uh, delivered a, a health-related solution that helped employers deliver health benefits to employees far less expensively, and her company was acquired in June of this year. Uh, Cheryl's been an extraordinary entrepreneur. Um, uh, I'm excited to, to sit down with her next week and talk uh, through her exit and her experience. Uh, these are the kinds of people that we're bringing in and the kinds of things that they do. They tackle the kinds of challenges that we see in health. Um, this is Spencer Hutchins. Spencer Hutchins created Concert Health based in San Diego, California. And the problem that he saw and the, he decided to tackle was a problem in this bifurcation of health and mental health. So uh, certainly in the United States, but I think in a number of systems throughout the world, that, that separation has caused problems. It's meant that patients 
who have physical health problems, but also have mental health problems, are not able to get those mental health problems dealt with or treated in the context of the services they get from an independent physician. So Spencer created a company to tackle that and has grown uh, enormously and very successfully in the company that he built to tackle that wicked problems. These are just two examples. There are many more. Um, and, and I'm going to take you from this notion of wicked problems and entrepreneurs into a particular context that, that is my pitch to you for why you should be thinking about wicked problems and not just uh, about the mundane problems that could lead to wealth creation for you as an entrepreneur. Jim Collins, who's uh, um, been a, an extraordinary source of wisdom in the world of entrepreneurship over the last couple of decades, uh, he wrote um, uh, Good to Great, Built to Last, uh, a, a host of other uh, extraordinary books. Uh, I'll take nothing away from him, uh, from, from Jim and what he says here. When I talk about his hedgehog concept as uh, something that you should know about, but that you should go beyond. So Jim uses this Isaiah Berlin uh, analogy. Isaiah Berlin is a philosopher who spoke about the fox and the hedgehog, talking about the foxes knowing many things, but the hedgehog as knowing one big thing. Jim Collins' hedgehog concept is focus on what you're passionate about, what you can be the best in the world at, and what drives your economic engine. Good advice.